This is a Library Channel special presentation. Constitution Day 2006, Part 2, Rebirth of a Nation, Origins and Ratification of the Constitution. Presented by Dr. Katherine Kaplan on the ASU Tempe campus in the Carson Ballroom of the Old Main Building. Our program will begin in just a few moments. Good afternoon and welcome back. We're going to proceed with the second part of our program featuring Dr. Katherine Kaplan, who is an assistant professor of history at the Department of History, College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She will be speaking on rebirth of a nation, origins and ratification of the Constitution. Dr. Kaplan comes to us um, from the College of William and Mary. She's been at Arizona State University since 2001, and she focuses on early American history. She's recently published an article about the Revolutionary War soldier, Joseph Plum Martin, and her forthcoming first book, We the Readers, Culture, Community, and Descent in the New Nation, 1790 to 1812, explores the importance of conceptions of masculinity to literary and political communities during the formative years of the Republic and investigates women's con contributions to ostensibly all-male cultural projects. Her new research concerns the life and philosophy of Elizabeth Ann Seton, whose efforts to build a Catholic women's community in the United States both challenged and relied on notions of womanly piety and domesticity. Without further ado, I'd like to Welcome, Dr. Katherine Kaplan. Thank you. Um, as an historian involved in telling people about the preparations for Constitution Day, I've encountered a particular reaction. And you can witness this reaction for yourselves by doing the following. Walk up to someone, look him or her in the eye, and say brightly, Happy Constitution Day. And they will look at you and shift back and forth a bit, and they'll say, What is that? And often the person will uh, start asking quite reasonable questions. Is this the day the Constitution came into effect? And you say, Well, no. I is it the day that the Ninth State ratified? Well, no. And then they say, what are we celebrating? And you explain that September 17, 1787, was the day the delegates to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia signed the Constitution. And your listener, grabbing at any straw, will say, oh, great, they all signed it. What effect did that have? And you say, well, actually, only 39 of 55 signed it, and the signing didn't really have any immediate effect. And you know, their eyes shift back and forth, and they walk away shaking their head. And I've come to believe that, you know, fine. September 17th may, in fact, be one of the single least interesting days of what was nonetheless a fascinating process. You have the American Revolution and the struggles of the critical period after it. You have the intense arguments over the nature of the Constitution during the convention. You have the tendentious ratification process afterward. And enshrining the day, September 17th, may in fact not make a lot of sense. But it has two really important things going for it, in my view. First, it brings people together here and elsewhere in order to think about, and I hope argue about, the structure of the American polity, the proper relationship between Americans and their government, uh, the clash of liberty and power. These are the very things that inspired 18th century Americans to hammer out the Constitution and work for its ratification, or in some instances, work against its ratification. And whatever the oddness of the details, the day serves that purpose. And second, as I've thought about it, I have decided that the impossibility of choosing a single perfect Constitution Day draws our attention to an important facet of American history and Americans' relationship to our founding documents. 
Americans have, I think, a striking attachment to texts, to words from our history, at least as much as we think of buildings or landscapes as being the centerpieces of American identity, we think of documents in that way. The Declaration of Independence, the Gettysburg Address, the Constitution, and in fact, sometimes when we build a monument, we go ahead and write the words on it afterwards. The Jefferson Memorial has the Declaration on it, for example. And the effect of this, on, on many of my students at least, can be to make these documents into rock-solid embodiments of American ideals, expressions of confidence and consensus of a kind of lost golden age. But in fact, the documents, all the ones I've mentioned, emerged out of long and positively hair-raising processes. And Americans were pressed to articulate their ideals most memorably at moments of instability and uncertainty, disagreement, and even crisis. Significant numbers of colonists remained loyal to the king at the time of the Declaration of Independence. The country, of course, was torn asunder at the time of the Gettysburg Address. But it is the Constitution that is tied most profoundly, and I think most productively, uh, to contestation of interest, to dissent. When I teach, students are often curious about how a document that emerged out of conflict could prove so enduring. And my own view is that it has endured in no small measure because it was crafted by men who understood, through their study of recent and ancient history, that interests always collide. That principle always has to be reconciled with possibility and with other principles and that the best way to work for harmony and order was to find a way in which disagreement could occur through politics, through words, through elections, rather than being silenced and then erupting in violence. And as I think and teach about this, I'm always reminded of the tragic flaw at the heart of the original Constitution, which was slavery. And it may be no coincidence that slavery was uh, the subject not really open for discussion at the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution dealt with that subject only with pained indirectness. And in fact, delegates embedded a demand for 20 years of silence over the slave trade in the document. And it was this repressed but ultimately irrepressible issue of slavery that temporarily broke the Constitution and the Union with it less than 100 years after the founding. But even with that tragic flaw and other limitations of the Constitution, the document has proved remarkably powerful and lasting. And it has, through its endurance and the flexibility provided by the amendment process, been used as a tool to defend liberty and individual rights, even rights not in the minds of the founders at the time of the founding. But it's also important to note that the document is not only about liberty, but about power as well. If we go back to September 17, 1787, and we imagine that we're watching the signers gathering around the document and signing its final page, we can ask, why were they taking this risk? Why were they lending their names and their prestige to this document? And the answer, in no small measure, is that they believed that a more powerful central government was necessary if the republic was to survive. Any constitution tells us not only what people hope for, but what they're afraid of. The document, like a utopia, is trying to create something, and it's trying to prevent something as well. And the American Constitution tells us how the fears of many Americans had changed dramatically over the course of the Revolutionary Era. In 1776, the great evil in the world was centralized power, uh, most threateningly embodied in the British Parliament, but it lurked in any potential government. And as they struggled to end the power of England over them, Americans wrote state constitutions that hemmed in their own governments. The states had weak, puny governors, and they had powerful legislatures because the legislative branch was thought to be the only branch that was the branch of the people. Those representatives themselves were subject to frequent elections. The Articles of Confederation was the plan for uniting these states into a working unit. It had no real executive, no power to tax, no power to compel the states to do its bidding. 
uh, to the horror of those who were trying to conduct a war at times under this article. And even that government, as weak as it was, wasn't ratified formally until very late in the war. So the state constitutions and the Articles of Confederation are, in a sense, reactionary documents. And the fear that motivates them is the fear of power. But after the Revolutionary War, some Americans began to see another threat looming, and that threat was chaos. The Articles government was too weak to compel states to obey the provisions of the peace treaty, too weak to expel the British from forts in the Old Northwest, too weak perhaps to put down domestic insurrections. Americans didn't just fear, fear others, they feared themselves. And because the Articles government required all the state legislatures to ratify any amendment, it was largely unalterable. It was weak but immovable. And this was a combination that drove James Madison and Alexander Hamilton and others wild. Madison called it an imbecile government. And all of those who gathered in Philadelphia, 55 delegates from 12 states, tiny, intractable Rhode Island just refused to participate. But the delegates all believed that a centralized government was necessary in order to allow the Union to survive threats from without and from within. Yet these same people were still engaged in a quest for liberty as well. And even some of the men who gathered were alarmed by the plan for national government that emerged as the centerpiece of the convention. Only argument and compromise enabled the delegates to hammer out a plan which they felt steered a course between tyranny and chaos. The central compromise, as we know, arose when small states successfully demanded equal representation in the Senate and large states achieved proportional representation in the House. But delegates also argued over, for example, the power of the executive. Some wished to hem it in, and some even wished to divide the power among three people. Why? Because three people would never agree, and a three-man executive couldn't wield power with the kind of brutal efficiency that a good dictatorship requires. Others, though, fearing chaos and collapse, wanted a really strong executive. And Alexander Hamilton famously gave a speech arguing for a president elected for life. After the speech, by the way, the delegates apparently just kind of shuffled their papers and left. And they returned the next day with renewed devotion to hammering out the smaller disagreements that existed between them when this, you know, po the possibility of an elective monarchy loomed from Hamilton. But despite these successful compromises, some delegates to the convention could not accept the document that emerged. They felt it created a leviathan, a central government that would trample on liberties rather than defending them. Some went home before the process was completed. A few even stayed to the end and then refused to sign. And so if we cast our eyes up from the signature line to the first words of the text, we find a phrase that had, on that first Constitution Day, virtually no meaning. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. And you think, we the people? The people had not formed the Constitution. A group of men of a particular political view had formed it, and they had, in fact, nailed the window shut where they were deliberating so that we the people wouldn't know what was going on inside. But they believe strongly that a meaningful connection between the people and the document had to be created. It had to be created after the signing. The, the Constitution had to be made true. And the, con the Convention set forth the process by which this would occur. States would call special ratifying conventions or votes, and if and when nine states ratified the Constitution, it would come into effect. Now we can ask ourselves, was this really legal? I mean, the Articles of Confederation had required the unanimous approval of the state legislatures if a revision was to be, was to be achieved. Um, the founders were essentially doing an end run around procedures that they considered hopelessly unwieldy. They were convinced they were serving the public good, but many Americans were utterly appalled by the ratification process, by the document. Patrick Henry, who had refused to attend the convention, uh, saying, I smell a rat, lent his considerable prestige and oratorical thunder to the efforts 
to, uh, to defeating the Constitution. And this drove poor five foot three, quietly analytical Madison just to despair, having to, having to argue against Henry, but Madison did it. Mercy Otis Warren, who was an ardent anti-federalist, compared those who supported the Constitution to loyalists. And she said America was threatened by dark, secret, and profound intrigues of statesmen practiced in despotism. And another anti-federalist called constitutional supporters the haughty lordlings of the convention. I just adore that phrase. It's my only excuse for throwing it in, is I just love that haughty lordlings phrase. So the federalists, as they styled themselves, um, knew that they faced an uphill battle. And in fact, historians agree that had it been possible somehow to put the document to a vote uh, so that every eligible voter could have voted on the document in the fall, say, of 1787, it would have been defeated. But through the process of ratification, the Federalists, the supporters of the Constitution, uh, drew Americans along to their cause. Now, some of this is absolute bare-knuckled po politics. So, for example, Pennsylvania supporters of the Constitution called a convention so fast that the Anti-Federalists had no time to organize uh, voters against it. By contrast, when supporters of the Constitution learned that New Hampshire seemed to be about to vote the Constitution down, they managed to have uh, the convention suspended so more information could be gathered. And by the time the New Hampshire uh, convention reconvened, other states have ratified the Constitution. And instead of being kind of a red flag and getting momentum going against the Constitution, New Hampshire became a crucial ratifying state. But it was not, I uh, have to tell you, only pragma pragmatic politics, not just interest at work here. The process of arguing over the Constitution also forced Americans to articulate some of the basic principles of their government. It served a function of education, and in one crucial way, it changed the document. Um, and I'll just briefly introduce four of the key objections to the Constitution. Um, and the answers to them. And the first key objection was that the Constitution created uh, imperio in imperium. You're all looking at me like, yeah, that's what I always say, imperio in imperium. Th this is actually a, a pretty uh, well-known 18th century view that a government could only have one sovereign head. And by having a federal government and state governments, you created a kind of two-headed beast. It was, it was impossible that such a thing could exist. Now, the Federalists, led by Madison, but other supporters of the Constitution said, this is not an issue. Two sovereigns is not an issue. Why? I actually stand here threateningly until my students answer, but I'll tell you the answer. And the answer is that there is one sovereign, and it is the people, right? The people delegate some of their power to the federal government, some to the states, but there is one font of authority in the republic, and it is the people. And the Federalists went on to argue that the people are represented not only in the legislature, as the classical view of politics would hold, but also in the executive, because the people have a hand in choosing the executive. So that the people are everywhere and everywhere in control. And the government then is neither a logical impossibility nor a monstrous threat, but a tool of the public to be used as they see fit. Another question that anti-federalists asked was, how does the Constitution ensure a virtuous citizenry? Where does virtue come from in this system? And Madison famously wrote that if men were angels, no government would be necessary. The Constitution allows, he felt, for self-interest to be channeled in ways that promote the public good. The processes of government would protect those who live under the Constitution from the worst tendencies of human nature. Um, but I have to say that this Madisonian skepticism about virtue is, is often overstated, and I 
see it as uh, James Madison being turned kind of into Mae West saying goodness has nothing to do with it. Um, and in fact, goodness did have something to do with it in the eyes of Madison and the other founders. They believed that a certain amount of virtue was necessary uh, in order for there to be citizens who elected good representatives. And they argued that America would have to produce an educated, informed citizenry with some interest in the public good. Uh, but uh, men would not have to become angels in order for the republic to succeed. The next objection was that the republic was just too big, too riven by conflict, um, that uh, bringing together so many different kinds of people could not possibly succeed. And some of those who had fought the revolution were were really angered that the Constitution seemed to abandon this revolutionary dream of a people speaking with one voice. And the Federalist answer to that is yes, we have given up on that dream. And they argue that an extensive republic would prevent a dangerous majority from developing. It would be more stable, it would protect individual rights better exactly because you wouldn't have 90% of the people sharing some interest ganging up and oppressing the other 10%. So the Federalists are pushing this kind of central tenet of the American polity, which is that we don't all have to get along, um, and that we're in fact much better off, much safer, if we don't all get along. And lastly, uh, before I conclude, the most powerful anti-federalist argument was really a question. And the question was, where is the Bill of Rights? So that even some of those who had attended the Constitutional Convention had assumed that the Constitution, like state constitutions, would have a list of things that the government could not do, a list of protections. Um, George Mason, who had uh, argued for the need for a constitution, in fact was one of those who refused to sign it exactly because it lacked a Bill of Rights. Now, Madison initially objected to adding a Bill of Rights to the Constitution. As he pointed out, a Bill of Rights says what government cannot do, right? That's the essence of a Bill of Rights. Madison believed that the new American science of government needed no such guarantees. Other nations assume that government has all power except what's reserved in documents, such as the Magna Carta or a Bill of Rights. But in America, the government had no power except what the people expressly gave to it. The Constitution was not a charter of liberty granted by power, but a charter of power granted by liberty. A Bill of Rights would reverse, then, this logic, right? It would muddle the essential nature of the Constitution. And Madison and others also asked, well, what about the rights not enumerated? I mean, once you say you have the right to assembly, you have the right to freedom of speech, do you have the right to walk down the street on Tuesday if, if this isn't listed also? So that enumerating some rights might put everything else in jeopardy. Madison, as usual, had a tremendous amount of logic on his side, but other founders, including Thomas Jefferson, argued that a Bill of Rights nonetheless uh, was a good thing. It would educate Americans about their liberties, Jefferson argued. And in fact, if you stop Americans on the street and ask them to quote from the Constitution, odds are you'll get the Bill of Rights, which is, which is fine. Um, Madison also realized that there were some people who would accept ratification of the Constitution if they were reassured that a Bill of Rights would follow soon on. So rather like Constitution Day itself, a Bill of Rights might defy logic but kind of serve a civic purpose. And so Madison not only accepted the need for a Bill of Rights, he actually took up the task of drafting it. And believe it or not, he also wrote George Washington's speech endorsing a Bill of Rights Congress's reply thanking Washington for the speech, and Washington's reply thanking Congress for that wonderful thanks. So it's this sort of magnificent Madisonian monologue. Um, but it's a tremendous amount of personal intellect and influence being put to the service not of personal power, but to the service of documents attempting to hem in any given individual's power over the polity. And so the Bill of Rights, with, its, with their kind of stirring decorations, emerged from this stew of principle and pragmatic political considerations, 
And it, like the Constitution that we're celebrating, came out of dissent and compromise, and most importantly, I think, argument. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to come back for part three of our Constitution Day celebration, Watchdogs or Lapdogs, the Role of a Free Press and the First Amendment, presented by Dr. Joseph Rosamano.